what I ended up seeing was that my entire life was lived in, in the hypothetical perfection of if I had tried. So if I had studied, I would have gotten a hundred percent on this test. If I had actually practiced my music for the recital, I would have played it, performed it perfectly. And the reality of life is every time you choose a door, you close others. And so there's this, at least with me, there was this um, desire to live in and a fantasy of limitlessness rather than accepting limitations. How do you do, Lisa? Good to see you. Wonderful to see you too. It's Thank been you, a Jenny. long time we were going to speak. I don't know how long ago. You were in school. I'm going back starting in January. I took a leave of absence for a year. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so you're gone for a year. Okay. Yeah. So how much schooling do you have left then? Two and oh no, um, I three three and a half years. Well, two more, a year and a half more of classes, and then the and then it's dissertation writing. So it's three it's three years of classes, two years of writing the dissertation. And remind me, is this a research or clinical type of? It's degree. Jungian. It's I will not be a clinical psychologist. No, no, no. I don't don't want to be doing that. <laughs> it's um. It's Jungian psychology, but it's archetypal and depth psychology. It's Jungian, Hellman, um, some post -Jung other post-Jungians. And but. so you will be uh, licensed to speak to people, yes? Um, I will not have a clinical license to see patients, no. Well, how will you use <laughs> it, do you think? Is it just was for interest sake? Or? It is for interest Mo my what i like doing is storytelling um film television writing and um it was a way of accessing archetypal stories and understanding more about what makes a story powerful and and also just kind of to figure out myself a little better <laughs> and the people that i am interacting with and dealing with professionally and um personally. So it's so definitely some knowledge that I wanted to have, not necessarily that I wanted to do what your husband does and sit with a, sit with a person and analyze them. Yeah. Are you looking forward to going back? Are you ready? I am. I am looking forward to it and I'm scared. It's a lot of work. Well, a that sounds of... like a good uh, mix, right? It's got to yeah. be challenging or, or it's not enough for us. Really? Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. The storytelling. So that's very interesting because I've been getting up on stage with Jord and telling a story for 10 minutes before he comes up on stage. And that's new for me. I've, first of all, never been on stage. And I've never told a story in public either. So this has been very good for me. Um, and who knows at what level, right? Who knows how deep it'll go? And I'm also, you know, I'm reading, I'll read um, a, a chapter of his book and then reflect on that and then tell a story. Or I'll take something that's happened and just reflect on the meaning of it and tell it. And uh, our tour manager is a retired comedian, semi-retired. He was on the road for 20 years as a comedian. Now and then he gives me a thumbs up. If he gives me a thumbs up, I know I've done a good job that day. <laughs> but I'm only just a, I would say, a baby on stage. I, I'm really very at the beginning of understanding all of this. And uh, you've been doing this a long time, telling stories. It's hard. It never, it, I, for me, it never gets easier um, to be on stage. I, it's not a place that I'm comfortable at all. Um, one thing I have learned through through many, many, many mistakes is that the better prepared you are, the easier it is. Um, yeah, and I, I have a personal tendency to put things off and procrastinate and try and wing it. And winging is not necessarily the best thing to do if you're going to be speaking to a large group of people. Right, yeah. Well, that's good to hear. And it's um, encouraging for me to make sure that I take that time 
Sometimes do you like it? Oh, I like do it. Do you like? I like it, yeah. and and I, um, and the crowd also. I like it too. Yeah, yeah. I don't have any fear of the stage, but you know, I think part of that is that I ask for courage and strength before I go on stage, and I truly believe that I couldn't do that by myself, and I don't believe in the, you know I. I prepare myself to, so that I'm not alone on stage, and that gives me the courage to go out there. Otherwise, I yeah. don't think I would do it. One day after the lecture, I was in the elevator going back to my room, and there was a 14-year-old girl, or suppose, about 14-year-old, and her mom, and she said, that must be really scary to go up on stage. And I said, and the mom was looking at me, and I said, well, I said, I ask for courage and strength before I go out, and it's not scary. But if I didn't ask, yeah, I think it'd be scary. And her mother looked like she was okay with my answer, you know, and I was like, whew, I don't want to say something that isn't, you know, helpful. And so that was a good experience. It, it's been very interesting for me, and I'm, I'm really curious to know more about your history of telling stories, why you decided that the Jungian way was the way to go, and I know the archetypal dream analysis type of inspiration might be behind that. Anyway, will you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I've danced around Jung for a long time, like since I was uh, in high school, probably. Um, and part of, I was raised Swedenborgian. So it's a, Swedenborg was a, an 18th century Swedish mystic who, um, wrote an interpretation of the Bible as a, as a, um, in, he described the Bible in the language of correspondences. So it's a way of reading it as something that is living and relevant to us, not just a text that is a, an historical text. So I liked the mystical aspect of Jung, um, and that he approached life, um, from a, desire for meaning as opposed to Freud, where it was all about sex. Not that I have any problem with that, but I think that is more than that. Um, and they can be the same thing in some instances. Um, but, and weirdly, the things that interested me, interested Jung, um, peripherally, like astrology, I had no idea that Jung was steeped in astrology and alchemy, um, mythology. I was always a huge fan um, and avid reader of Joseph Campbell. And I think that's what started me in um, wanting to go into entertainment. I was in, um, I did a semester at, uh, at theological school and realized through that that really wasn't where my primary love was. And then it was, it was in a something broader and it, and it was about these big mythological stories. So that was kind of the foundation for my interest in Jung. And I, and I never went at it directly. It was always tangentially. And Jordan, actually, what interested me so much in Jordan's lectures when he, when he put them up online was the fact that he is so steeped in Jung and that he is just like a, probably the greatest popularizer of Jung ever. Um, so he in many ways was an inspiration for me to go and back, go learn myself rather than just have to absorb it, um, you know, through third parties. Which books have you read of Carl Jung's? Oh my gosh. Um, they're right there. You can see. Them. Um, we read parts of all of them. We don't do cover to cover um, for any book yet, but um, no, that's not true. That's not true. Man in a symbol. So we had to read the entire thing. Um, and, um, what is the other one? Um, you know what? I read a lot of, um, sorry, I'm looking backwards. <laughs> um, Ion, I read a lot of, I'm not a, she's cheap... supposed to be a hard one. It's, I don't get it. Um, but I think it's me, obviously. Um, uh, yeah. So I haven't done, we're, do, we're doing types next semester, uh, in two semesters. So I don't know anything about psychological types. So don't ask me any questions about. I won't ask my, you. I don't know anything about them either. <laughs> have you, do you, 
I mean, you obviously get young through, through osmosis. osmosis. Jordan. That's right. It's it mostly <laughs> through osmosis. Does it interest you? It doesn't. Well, um, I've always had really vivid dreams. Mm. And so the dream analysis aspect of uh, interpreting dreams, I've found very helpful and, and interesting. You know, I've, I've been able to understand where I, where I struggle and where there's blocks and uh, old patterns that are, you know, coming up and stuff. And I find that absolutely fascinating and enlightening and helpful, you know, helpful because I have Jordan here to bounce my dreams off of and uh, he's a master of interpreting them. You know, he asks all the right questions, it seems, and then they become clear. So, yeah. 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 You know, and we've tried to go to his castle a bunch of times, but we haven't mm -hmm. got there yet. I hope you managed to do that. I would love that. I haven't been either. Have you? Do you find that Jung um, enters into your relationships, your relationship with Jordan specifically, like unconsciously, archetypally, and the projection of your anim animus? in your interactions with him or does do you do you see the the knowledge of Jung being a big part of your relationship I think probably yes I would say that you know because he is so interested in and um uses his knowledge of all of Jung's writings and thoughts that when we are going through something that is um, not exactly known, you know, in relationships often, even though you're having a disagreement about something during the day, it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. And then you have to be humble enough to admit that and to be open to a different interpretation. I think that's where Jung comes into our uh, understanding as well as Jung's Jordan's Jordan's interpretation of Jung's work through um, the biblical stories too. So, mm -hmm. you know, and last night we were talking about neurology. I was doing some Pilates and the woman had me, she had medicine balls, but a different weight on one side than the other and having me do lay on the floor and like lift, went, lift them but one was two pounds and one was four pounds. And I was saying how much fun that was. because Not that it was super heavy or anything, but something about that was very good. I liked it. And, and George said, well, that, and, and she told me, you know, it was neurological training because she trains people who have neurological troubles. So she knows all of these exercises. Um, anyway, we were talking about neurology and how neurology... I said, does it go right down to the DNA? And he said, yes. When you change something neurologically, it changes what genes turn on as well because it's a new way. And I thought, well, that's... He said, yeah, it's straight. It's It goes right from DNA straight up. He's um, straight up right to the, the movements that you're making. So, um, yeah, you know, I mean, every time we talk, it goes goes, you know, to right down to the DNA or from Jacob's ladder or from the earth to heaven or, you know, it's going to be one thing or the other in all of this, really, you know, because he said last night we were talking about what he learned and how he learned it. And he said, well, you know, he learned about Egyptian, Egyptian uh, culture and, and uh, mythology and mm -hmm before he learned about Christianity, really, before he was reading other works and the great psychologists that he read. And I said, so really, it's a, kind of a historical. You're, you're going historically, because it's not like Christianity was happening at the same time of, as the Egyptians. The Egyptians, it, that was first. That was before that. And this Christianity grew out of that time. And so he's just gone back as far as he could go to see the, to compare those. So he'll compare. And then with the 
comparing, he'll compare it to his work in Christianity or his work with Jung and then Christianity or Egyptian or Mesopotamia. And so he, t yeah, so I'm learning as I travel with him, I ask him, how does that brain work? You know, how do you, <laughs> how do you get on stage and talk without any notes or anything? Well, I have a library and I have all the Egyptian work here and I have all the Mesopotamian work here and Jung is here. And I'm like, okay, that sounds like, I could never do that, and I don't know who could, but yep, I believe you. That's what you do. <laughs> and he connects them all. Yeah, he connects them. In a way, what's so beautiful is that they're all relevant. He connects them so that we see that they are us, right? Because that we, we live the stories that the Egyptians wrote in their mythology and the the trials of the children of Israel through the wilderness and Jesus's life is the life we should model. It It's all us, right? So all of it is relevant. It's, it's all the human condition or the, the path of growth for the ideal, ideally for the human. But how do we Not tell when we're on that path? You know, how do we tell in our daily life? from morning till night, how do we tell that we're on that meaningful path? That's that's a question that's always coming up for me. What? How do you answer that question? Well, when I was saying that the balls were in interesting, I said that's interest, it's challenging. It was challenging and it was interesting. Well, what does challenging and interesting mean? What's the meaning of challenge and what's the meaning of interest? And I was I was just thinking it was fun. That was my interpretation. Oh, this is fun. I like this. But then I thought, well, it's also challenging, so that makes it fun. And then he said, yeah, but you know, it's neurological too, so it's going down through your neurons to your DNA. So I'm because it's interesting, I'm accessing my DNA. That's so that's so uh, mind expanding to think that way. Yeah. Well, years ago, there was a, a writer named Bruce Lipton who wrote a book on biology of belief. And he talked about epigenetics and no one had really been talking about epigenetics before that. But one of the things he articulated, which was brilliant, was the I, we always think of the nucleus of the cell being the brain, right? Because that's uh, that's where the DNA is. But really, the cell, the membrane of the cell is the brain of the cell. And because it's permeable, the chemicals from your exercise and you generate oxytocin or whatever biochemical you create and it gets in your bloodstream and it does cross cell membrane. And that's how it impacts the DNA because it can get in there. When you generate the, all these chemicals, these endorphins from working out, it actually does it affect your biochemistry at the most basic level. And that's what epigenetics is because the cell changes as it's exposed to different chemicals, whether you ingest them or you create them through exercise or that's how the way we live impacts how we did manifest our gene expression. Right. So if somebody's worrying all the time, or if they if they've been in a situation that was dangerous and now they worry all the time, yeah. and that that so when it happened, those neurochemicals, those uh, neurochemicals that um, are released when there's stress, so cortisol. Yeah, basically is what I know about. So then that would go through into the cell and actually change the cell. Yeah. And maybe, I don't know, but is this part of epigenetics that the more traumatic the occurrence, the more changed the cell is and the more difficulty it would have normalizing again? I would think so. I don't know that I'm not a biochemist or geneticist I you know I'm just it was interesting when I read it years ago what they some of the studies showed though is that it changes gene expression to the degree that it can even be passed down yeah so that's right. why like in the second world war the women who had been in camps and starved had children who gained weight more easily so that's how you shift gene, gene expression. I would think the more extreme, if you know, if you just went on a diet, I don't think your children would necessarily get fat easy, more easily. But if you're starved, 
then you pass on a thrifty gene so that you you don't waste a lot of calories. So yeah, I do think you know the more extreme, the more the more pronounced the um, the expression would be, and it's heritable, which is wild. Yeah, and in the Bible that talks about you know seven generations, seven generations, you know that recurs lots through the text, and I wonder how long these traumas last and if they're seven generations that's that's like 300 years or 350 years it's a long time that something can you know change and and you're not and you might not be aware that you've you've actually uh, been in a situation that was so traumatic that your life is changed but there's ways i think maybe with what you're doing to tap into those times and to heal from them yeah i i think the more conscious we are of our, of our woundings our complexes the more able we are to address them if we are always um denying or suppressing or running away or avoiding, you can't really uh, heal at all. Um, So I do think what I'm doing is is certainly beneficial for me, definitely has um, helped me deal with and process a lot of my own issues. Um, And I do think becoming conscious is one of, you know, we talked about how do we know when we're we're, when we're doing the right thing, when yeah. we are mm-hmm. in this place. And I do think that um, being in growth, be con- consciously committing to growth is one of the ways we know. And you you um, can't really do that unless you're m- honest with yourself. Well, first of all, because we all lie to ourselves all the time. Um, and I think with Jung, it's just a it's one of the many tools that are, is available for people to become more aware of things that are going on interiorly. Um, it makes it harder once once it's in, in black and white on a page. It's harder for you to pretend that it's not happening. You know, to pretend that your attraction to that other person is is anything other than a projection. That you know that it, that's something um, more real than that. Um, so I I think. I think conscious, it is helping me become more conscious of my motivations, of my actions, of, um, of past hurts, um, of, of the, some of my behaviors. It's, it's, and it's interesting to, um, once it's, it's part of your repertoire. You do it unconsciously all the time. You start questioning yourself, like, why am I doing this? And it's, and you start to use it on other people too. And you like, it's easy. It, in some ways it's easier because you cut people some slack when you can kind of see why they may be behaving in a very um, defensive way or um, falling into patterns of behavior that normally would drive you crazy. And you can see why they may be doing that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you read "Addicted to Perfection." I remember that. I yes, <laughs> yeah. Did you? <laughs> I've been thinking. I read it. You know, back whenever we first talked, and I wrote notes, but I can't find them. Of course, they should have been where I thought they were, but they weren't. <laughs> but I do remember the book somewhat, and I remember that it had to do with being making this one mistake which is looking for perfection where there isn't any and recognizing and and learning to recognize that you're looking for perfection let's talk about that a little bit because lots of people everybody suffers from that some yeah i think who was the the author of that sorry who was the author of that book do you um, remember? Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Take me, no, it'll take me one okay. second. Okay. Um, Marion Woodman. Oh, yes, that's right. That's Hard right. for me to remember, like, authors, names, books. Like, you're like, what <laughs> young have you read? It's like a 15 <laughs> volumes, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, she she's brilliant. Um, and that, that I was doing a paper on the mother complex, as, we, you know, we all have multiple complexes. That happens to be one of mine. Um, and it was a great resource for that. 
um, just and being an oldest child, you the expectations that are put on you do kind of lead to uh, a need for perfection. In which what, is impossible. in what way? Because I'm a youngest child, so I had a total, almost mm-hmm. an only child, so I have different things going on. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't know why, but oldest children tend to be, um, overachievers. I am not an overachiever, but the, uh, expectation that I would be successful and, um, uh, was always there. Not that it's not on younger children, but I think older, oldest, oldest children kind of embody all the hopes and dreams of, of new parents and then by the time they're at their third with at least, at least with us by the time they're at their third or fourth children who i adore i love them but that you know you know you've been down this road before you know that they're gonna make mistakes and and there aren't that you know mm-hmm. so then it's uh Child. growing up there's perfection that you're looking looking for perfection in your own actions that yeah well you know i have a little of that too though Actually, what I have is that if I'm going to do something, I don't want anyone else to be there, right? Really? Right, because I don't want to... And it's funny because I'll go out on stage. I could easily make a mistake there. But that's okay with me. That's okay with me. But if I'm doing something like drawing or painting or playing the piano, I want to be by myself. I want to be by myself. And I think that's kind of odd, and I don't know where that's coming from. So that's what I've been looking at lately is well why why don't i just play all the time when anybody's around because it would be nice well, if i did I'll, so with me and it may be part i'll just share this with you because it may be relevant for what you're experiencing because there was this expectation of perfection and i knew even as a toddler that that was not the reality there was this Ill- projection of being the perfect child always well behaved always doing what was expected but and things came easily but as soon as they didn't there was a, a um almost an opting out and so what i ended up seeing was that my entire life was lived in in the hypothetical perfection of if i had tried so if i had studied I would have gotten a hundred percent on this test. If I had actually practiced my music for the recital, I would have played it, performed it perfectly. And the reality of life is every time you choose a door, you close others. And so there's this, at least with me, there was this um, desire to live in and the fantasy of limitlessness rather than accepting limitations. And so I think with you, maybe with the drawing and the, if other people see it, you can't live in the fantasy that it would be perfect. If, right. You know, right, right, right. You have, because there's a witness there yeah. besides you yeah. that you can just rip it up if it wasn't what you thought, you know, but once it's a witness, it concretizes the limitation. Yeah. Fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a tricky one. Fantasy, right? It's hard to recognize when you're living in fantasy. That's another one. I So I joined Al-Anon after I was ill in 2019, one of my friends took me to an Al-Anon uh, meeting and I went with her because I loved her and I'll go, I said I'd just go with her. And when I got there, I thought, oh yeah, all the ways these people are talking sounds a lot like some of the things I think about. So I went to you know six meetings and then I read all the books and I went to a number of meetings for a long time and did a lot of um, a lot of analysis of myself, self-analysis of myself. And I know that al when they first, AA, when they first began, it was Carl Jung's work that inspired them. So mm-hmm. it's no wonder that it's been sustained, that it sustained itself for so many years and so many people find it helpful because the basic philosophy of it is brilliant right Mm -hmm. anyway i've I've found uh, a lot of self-reflection having the humility to self-reflect as you said to look back and see who we are and to admit that we still have things to learn right along the way now how did how did uh addicted to perfection that train of thought 
um, affect your parenting? Well, I gave it to all my daughters right away. And I said, I'm sorry you know? if I... How do you know you gave hmm? it to all your daughters? How do you know that? Well, I gave the books to all my oh, daughters. Oh, you gave the books to all your daughters. <laughs> I see. Oh, I see. And did because, any of them read it? Uh, two of them. Oh, congratulations. I think, yeah, I think the, the, they all sort of glanced at it, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't top of priority. They all have very busy lives. Um, but the one who's a psychologist, she read it and uh, she she thought it was definitely relevant. Um, but I think all of us, no, no no matter how good your parents were or how good you are as a parent, we make mistakes. And even when they're not mistakes, they can still end up wounding our children. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because children need to learn to survive. If you keep a baby in a bubble, they literally will not survive. And so I think parenting is a way of preparing. It's, it's supposed to be the way we prepare our children for the world to be responsible and resilient and um, problem solvers and co compassionate. And so I, it's not that we want to make mistakes, but we do. And, um, and so I, I think it's useful for kids to understand, well, children, for all of us to understand that as parents and as children, as wounded children to, you know, to, to realize that, while some of some parents make very hurtful mistakes with their kids, um, they're things that they they become part of our toolbox, you yeah, know, for, right, right. for the rest of the world. Yeah, my dad's ninety two. I just went to see <clears> him, <throat> and he's getting he's getting quite elderly. And he had we thought yeah. we were going to have to put him in long term care, but he's rallied again. So he said, you know, I had an episode, and now. I'm better. So <laughs> off he goes again. He's living with his second wife and she takes really good care of him. So he's managing to stay at home. And we're very grateful for that. But I have been able to go to him, even though my life with my parents, my dad, my mom and I got along very well. And she would, she had more trouble than him, I would say, with herself, you know, and her past and whatever she was dealt and my dad never knew what to do with it. And uh, so I saw him through her lens quite a bit mm -hmm. of my life. But then she got sick and she died. And it was time for me to get to know my father, which, I, and I did. And now, mm -hmm. years later, because she died 15 years ago, quite a while ago, um, I went to see him and I can tell him the things that I've reflected on from my childhood that I now recognize were uh, helpful to me, you know, and uh, it's nice to be able to share those things with him, even though his short-term memory is pretty much gone. I, you know, he, I can see him smile or I can see him looking at him like, ah, never thought you'd figure that out, you know, <laughs> I can see him look at me. In <laughs> fact, he's, um, he's still himself. He's still a teasy fun guy he just doesn't remember from one episode to the yeah. next and it doesn't matter he's uh i feel i feel good about seeing him and i feel good that i've been able to in a way make amends with him mm -hmm. uh, and just and more than once so hooray for that and for yeah. me that sound that seems like a um a hurdle a life hurdle that all of us hope to get over is any yeah. any kind of resentment or hard feelings that we might have towards our parents because they did do the best they could and some of yeah. them made terrible mistakes. My dad, you know, he made mistakes. I didn't see him as much as I wanted and, uh, and he was, you know, busy doing other things not really spending much time with me as the fourth kid, like I said. So they were done having children by the time I was around. But turns out I'm quite a bit like him now anyway, so I guess he rubbed off on me. and he So he must have been around enough, right? <laughs> so if you think that your parents 
weren't around much, but you're just like them. They probably were around more than you can remember. So it's been good. Al-Anon has been good for healing my relationships and for taking responsibility for uh, for all my thoughts and actions. In Al-Anon, is it like is it like um, AA in that the first thing you do is acknowledge a higher power because you are powerless to the yeah the first situation. thing you do is you admit you're powerless over people, places, and things. Actually, that's what you. It's not alcohol no. necessarily. It's people, places, and things. And then the second step is that you uh, accept that there's a higher power. Something bigger so, than you. Based on your first, our first conversation, the first question, which was, "How do you know when you're on the right path?" I think part of it is the submission to something higher than your own will and whim, and I think that is what makes. And I think probably all of us should do Al-Anon, honestly, because we all are power. We don't even realize what we're powerless to, whether it's our iPhones or food or um shopping or you any, name it yeah yeah so i think we all have addictive tendencies that me we too i see that now now that i've been through it i just see it and my relationships not just my relationships with my son my daughter in fact my daughter was on a podcast the other day with someone who was talking about religious matters and she said, uh, Mum's affiliation with Al-Anon helped me to um, understand my own faith. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's a really good program. You know, and lots of people have had really no good relationships with, with adults maybe or with yeah. men. And so the idea of God is uh, oft sometimes hard for them. But in Al Anon, they've made it easier because you can you can decide that going outside and walking outside and being with nature is your higher power, and just go there and uh, go where you feel that you can be yourself and lean on something. You, you can lean on something if you can lean on a tree and believe in it. Then you're you're doing better than not leaning on the tree and thinking you're alone because we don't have to be alone. You know, when I was really ill, I'd go outside the hospital and go walk where there were lots of beautiful flowers blooming. And that was good. So nature for me is a, that that's a really good thing. It's yeah. a higher, higher power for sure. If I, if I have something to mull over, I'll walk around the block a few times. And that seems to really help me to accept another way a better way yeah and this is this is pretty much what i do now that's i don't i don't find anything better to do and i would you know you're studying young and i can see that being yep that's a that's a great avenue towards the same thing finding out who we are and who everybody else is and what we're doing here and what the best way forward is day to day yeah it's uh and you went on and you went on a political you went on a <laughs> political adventure for a year right like exactly. really what was that like for you um oh so young talks about the the confluence of opposites it's all about reconciling or or integrating the opposites and there's this thing that you know he talks about a lot is an antiodromia which is the swing to its opposite everything has this tendency to balance out by its a swing to its op opposite it was actually i think heraclitus who posed it proposed an, an antiodromia first anyway it was that was an experience of the most possible opposites um incredible highs incredible lows um feeling very purpose driven and then feeling completely out of control um the very 
um, a surrender, which was kind of weird. Um, not feeling like, um, like I was in control, but at the same time feeling fully comfortable with who I was and where I was and what I was doing, really not giving a damn what people thought at a certain point. Cause you can't, you really can't because the, I mean, you know, you've lived with this too. The, tro- the trolls are just wow. like, <laughs> oh, um, yeah. so you just have to say I'm done and I don't care and bless and release realize that they've got their own issues and it, it's all projection and it really has nothing to do with you, which was very helpful. Um, but um, while it was not fun um, and there were days that were completely mundane and just driving, we put 50,000 miles on the car in nine months. Um, so driving from one end of the state to another, um, but at the same time learning a lot and can you tell us a couple of things you learned um that how how much i adore my husband um and i always i have loved him for since i before i knew him um he was is my um soulmate but um just being beside him and watching him and trying to support him and the level of sacrifice and commitment mm, took my understanding of our relationship to a completely different level realizing so that was one thing i learned we also i i learned i how hard life is for so many people and i i have lived a very blessed life um, and I've always been surrounded by people who are intelligent and hardworking and I, I, successful and have had less of an immersion in communities where every day is painful to get up. And um, so Understand, and that being said, realizing how resilient these people are, and how much they want just the ability for to do what they need to do, and to get government or whoever out of their way, so, and so that they can. People, COVID really messed up a lot of businesses and families, and just the desire to get back to normalcy. Um, but how hardworking people are and um, and optimistic in the face of hardship. Uh, there, it, it was a really inspiring year in many respects. And it was brilliant because again, it's young and his, and antiodromia and the pendulum swing. My husband is one, is the most accomplished and one of the most brilliant and successful people I've ever known. Certainly by far the most accomplished of anyone running for the Senate. The, I never for a minute, I was always the, you know, doubting Debbie going, oh no, what if we win? And everyone's like, no, I mean, what if we lose? And everyone's like, no, 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 you will, you have to, you, there's no way you can't win. Look at the circumstances. And then for him to lose was like the first time really that I think that we as a couple have experienced that level of failure and to still be standing and our relationship to be stronger and our family to be stronger and our kids to be so um, supportive and proud and for us all to know who we are and what we stand for in spite of failure. And most importantly was to see, for our kids anyway, for them to see their dad who works so hard and tries so hard to try really hard and give it his best and give him give it everything and fail because it allows them to not be afraid of anything because even when you fail there is a, a personal strength there and so i think that was a 
the gift if there <laughs> we can find one in the sure, in the process. I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can at least because you're so thoughtful, you can do that. And I think that's the right I think that's right. You know, I even feel with all the illness I went through, I can see the gift in that. And I think it's necessary to move forward and to learn from our experiences. It's just to find a way to grow stronger and just more thoughtful through the through whatever we go through and uh, you guys really you were just gone you know in the political landscape and I can't yeah. imagine what that might have been like I think uh, over time we'll hear maybe a little more about it as uh, as you get a little further from it because it was only just a short time ago yeah yeah a month ago was a the month election. ago yeah no not not any time at all no but it 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 i am glad we did it in some respects um it also is again an archetypal tale it's fascinating because you there there is not a single hero who does not have um a fall it, it is it is archetypal hero's journey. So, um, and it also indicates that there, that there are things with the good, the biggest lesson here are you cannot control everything. There are things that are so far out outside of your control, no matter what you do, there will always be something that is thrown into the mix. So our, our, one of our political advisors said halfway through the election, after the primary, he said, politics is a three-way chess game. You move, your opponent moves, and then God moves. And you really saw that in this election. It was the things that you wouldn't, Roe v. Wade being overturned. We, I mean, you couldn't right. have anticipated oh, that. Yeah. The single biggest factor of the election that was nowhere on, you know, on the horizon. So it, you do see that there are forces at work, whatever you want to call them, God or the fates or destiny that are, that are outside of your control. And I think that's an important lesson too. You do your best, but you, it's not up to you in the, in the end. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I learned when I was sick, that it wasn't up to me. Yeah. yeah. And thank goodness for that. You can feel a big weight <laughs> come off your shoulder when you realize that. Yeah. And that makes, that makes stepping out and doing things that are difficult, a challenge knowing that, that you don't have control over everything. And so you only have control over what you do right. have control over. And other than that, it's out of your hands. So you just do what you can do, but just let go of the rest. And well, because it really isn't, we're not playing the game we think we're playing, right? I mean, it, uh, uh, Jordan talks about meta games, and we think we're playing this game of, of success and whatever accomplishment on this level, but none, that's not really where the game is being played. You know, it's really, and you don't control what's happening, What you only control is yourself. And that is who you are, the character you're building, you know, the real character is the, is the game, not the avatar that we're living in the material world. No, I, I see this, what's going on now is, you know, communism because we talk of Canada as communist Canada now, we might as well, because that, that's the political <laughs> landscape right now. And I, I really do, as I get older and have lived more and fallen more, uh, I, I do believe that we have, uh, we have forsaken our religion and our faith, and what takes over is communism. Not just mm -hmm. communism, but that's one of the ways that you'll go because if it's not if it's not god and the garden of eden at the top then it can be all kinds of things at the top and that's what we're seeing now all kinds of things and until i think we find our way back to that garden of eden we are destined to be in this multiplicitous place of of uh different things being worshipped yeah yeah i well i was saying we were talking about ion before 
but there is this movement from age to age. And I feel like we're living in ancient Rome at around 100 AD, because there's a transition from the pre-Christian world to the Christian world at that time. And nothing was clear and it was all conflict. And we didn't know if Christianity, we, they, they at that time had no idea that Christianity would emerge as the, the as the zeitgeist of, of 2000 for 2000 years. And I think right now we're in a, in a time where Christianity, at least for the, since Nietzsche pronounced it, but it was probably happening before then Christianity has lost a lot of its influence globally. Um, I saw that we were in Europe and I definitely saw that in London and Paris that it, that it is, that it is not, there was not, the, there were lights, but there was no sense of Christmas, like that it's a religious holiday at all. Um, which is concerning to me because I'm very attached to my Christian faith. But when I step back and look outside of this time period, we are entering the age of Aquarius. And I don't know what the way that we connect to the divine will look like in the next two millennia. And I, and, I, and nothing seems to be rising at this moment. Communism could just be a way of dissolving everything because it's atheistic, it's it's totalitarian, it's communal to the degree that the individual is crushed. Um, and, and, and the beauty of Christianity is that it's all about an individual relationship with God, right? That's the, that's the foundation of Christianity. So I'm hopeful that, that in within divine providence, communism will just be a intermediate state and something good will emerge from it, but it's not pleasant and it's evil. I think. Yes, I do too. I think that there's satanic work going on and, uh, the more we talk to people and the more that people talk to us, the more that comes up as a as an explanation of what's going on now. So, but I, I have hope too. And hearing that from you who've been like all around, I don't know how broadly you traveled. How broadly did you travel through the States? Oh, just Pennsylvania. Just, just back and forth across Pennsylvania. Yeah. yeah, and got to know every constituency there, I guess. Yes? Well, just the Republicans for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. so you don't go into the Democratic parts of... There, a lot of the places you do, but there are both, but the, a lot of the, 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 when we would do rallies, the people that would come and we would talk to one-on-one -on -one, um, were Republicans and some independents and a, a bunch of Democrats who were leaving the party just because... They see socialism. I would, and you call, you know, the Canada communist, but we're the USSA. We're the United Socialist States of America. And socialism is creeping its way at a, you know, pace that makes me very uncomfortable. Um, in the White House now, too. So that's very disturbing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But, you know, I, I don't, who knows how far we have to go down that road before we see it for what it is. Right. I know. I mean, the Russians, the Chinese still haven't woken up and <laughs> the Russians, it took a while, quite a while. It took a couple of generations. Yeah, right? So. that's right. That's right. Um, hmm. We need to talk about something else. We can't end on this down note. <laughs> what else? Well, we could talk about, we could talk about Christmas. So yes, let's we're in Toronto, which is very nice. And we're going to spend Christmas with our family and our friends who we never, we hardly ever see because we're on the road all the time. I don't see my grandkids very often, but now I get to. So that's wonderful because they're still little. Every every month I'm away, I think, oh, they're a month older, you know, I have to get home. <laughs> the pull of being a grandmother is strong, you know, yeah. to be there, to be a part of that. It's quite strong. Like to be a mother is very, was very strong. To be a mother, right. you know, it pulled me towards you know, having a family. So it was very strong. But even being a grandmother, I can see the power of the um, the familial power of it pulling me to be that person who is uh, supportive, 
in yeah. a supporting role. Yeah. It's, I, I totally acknowledge what you're saying. And at the same time, I, I adore my four grandchildren. I love them so much. Becoming a grandmother was hard. And I don't know if you experienced this at all. When I had my first child going from being young woman to mother is a major identity shift, especially because you go through pregnancy. And I went through much of my life in uh, interacting with people in a way that, that, that acknowledged my sexuality. I was all, I wasn't overtly flirtatious, but the fact that, 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 that I was a sexual entity was always part of, of who I was and how I presented in the world. So being pregnant for that first time, it shifted how I interacted in the world. Being a grandmother, I did not expect to be a major identity shift. And like, I would not say crisis, but it kind of was because you do change from being the, from woman to crone, like overnight, you become, you said the supportive one, you're not the the mother, not the, not the one who's giving birth, not the, that character anymore in the play. You're now the, you're like out out in the sidelines and it changes who you are. You are a grandmother. And that is just such a different and complicated. And for me, difficult role to embrace. And it's my granddaughter is eight years old now, and I'm still kind of, easing my way into it. But I think it for women, it's kind of wrapped up in the whole aging thing, which is not, is, you know, one of those deaths, identity, ego deaths, which is necessary and good, but not easy. Well, also I I wonder, we have a lot of opportunities as, and we have health too, you know, like people are healthier than they were last generation. So being at a grandmother age now is not that much older. Uh, physically than than when I was at childbearing age or I don't even feel really that different and so there's that that is makes it tricky Um, because I I find I'm excited about it and I feel a pull but it's but it's confusing Mm -hmm. yeah it's confusing Um, because it used to be because roles just aren't defined anymore you know. So it's no wonder it's confusing. You know, I'm not sitting at home knitting booties and rocking in a <laughs> rocking chair. I'm just not doing that. And uh, yeah. so that so what am I doing? And how am I fulfilling that role? And my kids have nannies. I never had a nanny. I just yeah. raised my kids. And, and my husband and I raised our kids with no relatives or anybody around. We just raised them. And... My kids that live far away, they have a nanny, and my kids in town have a nanny. I think, oh, huh, and fair, fair enough, you know, if you you want to work and this is allowing you to work and it's giving someone a job, great, and it's giving your little kids someone else to be around and that they can depend on and stuff. That's wonderful. So yeah, the grandmother role, in a way, has, or at least in my experience has changed it's mm-hmm. different it's yeah. different than it was but it's still fun to be with them when we're with them That's it's fun to tease okay. them and make them laugh and all of that it's it's fun and i was buying books i bought i bought three little books because they're two they're just two and a bit and eight months old so they're just getting going but i, I bought three books one on uh one on anger, one on gratitude, and one on joy. Th- th- three little kids' books, and I and yeah, that's where that's where uh, that's where Christmas is taking me to those places. Well, this was really nice. I was sure hoping you were going to talk to me. I thought, man, it's been so long since we made this <laughs> appointment. So it was very good of you to honor that. I, I appreciate oh. it. I was happy just to get the opportunity to connect with you.